We live in a turning point in the history of the church. Scholars like to call this a post-Christian society. And so that raises an important question for us as Christians. How shall we now live in a post-Christian society? In other words, what is the distinguishing mark of a Christian that sets us apart from this post-Christian society? In other words, when followers of the Lord Jesus Christ gather together as we are here today to worship the triune God, to carry out the work of gospel ministry, and to engage in the task of apologetics and evangelism, what should we be known for? Stated succinctly, how shall we live as the people of God? Well, one answer to that question may be found in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 16, in what is known as the Upper Room Discourse, you will remember the setting. Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, one of his loyal supporters, has just left in order to betray the Messiah. And on the heels of Judas leaving to forsake his Lord, Jesus gives a parting exhortation to encourage his beleaguered disciples. He gives his disciples his final charge. He gives them words to put steel in their backs. He gives them a parting command, which we find in John 13, picking up in verse 31. Hear now the word of the Lord. When Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself and glorify Him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek Me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, I want you to let those words sink in to your soul for a minute. To overcome a world vandalized by betrayal and hate and sin and death, Jesus directs His followers to love one another. It's extraordinary. He's about to leave. He's about to be crucified. He's about to be betrayed. And His parting exhortation is to love. Now, that may ring hollow to you. After all, in our own day, love is pervasive, but it's impotent. Everyone talks about love, but no one truly defines it. Few actually know it. You see, sadly, in our day, many think of love in terms of self-gratification. They think of love in terms of self-absorption. 
For most people in this world, love is only a feeling that must be coddled and accommodated. I have my desires, I have my longings, I have my feelings, and in order to love me, you have to accommodate to my whims. And so as a result, in our day, love in our culture is a commodity to be used, not a commitment to be cultivated. And so as a result, people talk about falling out of love. Because I no longer feel loved. I no longer feel as though I am at the center of your affections. And so I will not reciprocate love any longer. It's a commodity to be used as you want, as you feel. Love is whimsical. However, for Christ here in John 13, love is more than whimsical palpitations. Love is an apologetic for the gospel in a post-Christian world. And so this morning, I want to think with you about the nature of love and how it relates to the task of apologetics for us as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the first place here in John 13, verses 31 to 33, we see the source of love, the source of love. As I've said, Judas has just left to betray Jesus. The long-expected hour has come. Jesus is anticipating His crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and reunion with His heavenly Father. Look again at verse 31. Jesus says, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in Him. He's longing to be reunited with His heavenly Father. In fact, Jesus will pick up this same theme in John 17. And if you keep your finger in John 13, turn over just a few pages to John 17. In John 17, we have Jesus' parting prayer. We're able to listen in as Jesus relays His final intercession before the Father on behalf of the people of God. And in John 17, Jesus longs to be reunited with the Father, and He summarizes His prayer in John 17, picking up in verse 22. And you'll hear the same themes from John 13. John 17, picking up in verse 22, Jesus says, The glory that you, Father, have given me, I have given to them, that is, the disciples, that they may be one even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfectly one. Why? So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that, desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. In these verses, we learn about the source of love in the extraordinary relationship between the Father and the Son. Jesus is reflecting back upon His eternal relationship with the Father. And here we learn that the Father and the Son share a common glory. They share a common unity, and they share a common love. Never was there a time when the Father did not, know, did not love the Son, and never was there a time when the Son did not love the Father. And yet the gospel tells us that even though we were sinners, God displays His love 
by giving to us His only begotten Son. For Christ and for us as Christians, the source of love is not in ourselves. The source of love is not in this world, ultimately. The ultimate source of love is located in God and God alone. After all, John will tell us in 1 John 4, God is love. So God Himself is the source of all love. And when we talk about the gospel, we understand that the work of redemption is a result of the eternal love of the triune God. And as you read through the Gospel of John, note how each member of the Trinity is engaged in the work of redemption in displaying God's eternal love to an unlovely people. And so, for example, in John Chapter 3, verse 16, perhaps the most well-known verse in the entire Bible, we are told that the Father, that God, what, so loved the world that He gave His Son. In John 17, Jesus says that He accomplishes the work of redemption as a result of His love for His people. And in John chapter 15, you can read Jesus speak of the Holy Spirit who enables us to fulfill the command of love. And so, it's the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together in a concert of love in order to redeem an unlovable people. We would not know love without the God of love redeeming us in love through His only begotten Son. And so the gospel announces to us that the source of love is not in ourselves. It's not whimsical. It doesn't fluctuate. It doesn't evaporate. You can't lose this eternal love. No, the source of love is in God, and therefore it's eternal. It is fixed and it is for you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see to begin with here that God alone is the source of love. Secondly, I want you to see in verse 34 of John chapter 13, the command of love. The command of love. Jesus says in verse 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Now, if you've ever read the Bible, you'll know that that command pervades almost every chapter, every book of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. The command to love one another in many ways is not specific to the gospel. It goes all the way back to the Old Covenant, to the Old Testament to the formation of the nation of Israel. What was to separate Israel from the pagan nations? What distinguishes Israel from Canaan? Well, the book of Leviticus tells us that the distinguishing mark of Israel is her love for one another. And so, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, God instructs His people to love their neighbors. Leviticus 19, picking up actually in verse 17, Moses tells the people of God, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. It's an extraordinary statement. Moses is saying, as you gather as the nation of Israel, what is to characterize your relationship? It's not hate. It's not bickering. 
It's not backbiting. It's not vengeance. It's not squabbling. It's not generational fights. Those things should not characterize your relationships with one another. Your relationships among yourselves as the people of God should be characterized by love for one another. Because we understand that we do not deserve the love of God. Israel should have remembered we deserved being slaves in Egypt. We did not love God. We grumbled against God. We hated one another. And yet, out of God's kindness, He delivers them out of Egypt and calls them as His special people. Hate may characterize Canaan, but love shapes the people of God. It's indicting, isn't it? It's applicable, isn't it? How often when we gather together as the people of God in local churches do we look at ourselves and we realize that squabbling characterizes the church of Jesus Christ. And here Moses is telling Israel it's not hate, but it's love that shapes the people of God. It's a command, a command to love. And so in continuity with all the Bible, Jesus in John 13 gives this final command, love one another. Why does he do that? Why is this the last thing he says? He's about to leave. He's about to be crucified. He's about to rise again from the dead. He's about to ascend into heaven. And he is no longer going to be physically present with His people. He's going to send His Spirit to empower them and guide them in truth. But He's not going to be there. The apostles ultimately aren't going to be there. And what is the one thing that sets them apart? It is their love for one another. And why is that important? Because when the watching world looks at the church and looks for evidence of the resurrected Christ, they need to see the love of Christ manifest in our lives. You see, Jesus understands that love is evidence of our relationship to Him. And so in John 14, verse 15, Jesus emphatically states, if you love me, you'll do what? Keep my commandments. Obey my commandments. But the opposite is true, right? If you do not love Him, you will not obey His commandments. Or if you do not obey, it must be the result of the fact that you do not love. Our love is evidence of Christ's love for us. Our love displays to the watching world the love of God for us in Christ Jesus. So however frail and feeble our efforts, despite our fumbling and bumbling and caring for one another, love is evidence of the work of Christ in us. Our acts of Christ-like love display the love of God for us in Jesus Christ. And the logic is very, very simple here. The logic of Jesus goes something like this. The Father loves me. I love you. You love one another. If you do not love each other, you must not love me. Because the Father loves me, I love you, and you love one another. This is exactly what Jesus says in John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verses 9 to 11. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, I love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, 
and that your joy may be full. Father has loved me. I love you. Therefore, you love one another. The love of Christ is fixed and certain and eternal and knows no limits, and we have no reason not to draw upon that love as we care for one another. It's an extraordinary statement. But dear friends, love for one another is not an option. It is a command rooted in God's love for us as the people of God. So we see the source of love in God. We see the command to love one another. It is the logic of love. The Father loves Christ. Christ loves us. We love one another. Thirdly, we see the model of love. Look again at verse 34. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you you also are to love one another. It's an extraordinary statement, isn't it? But what is new about this statement? In one sense, as we've already suggested, there is absolutely nothing new about the command to love. This goes all the way back to the Old Testament. There's nothing new. Well, what is new is not the principle. We've been commanded to love for a long time. What is new is not the principle. What is new is the paradigm. We have a new paradigm for love. We are to love one another. What's the key phrase? Just as I have loved you. The sacrificial love of Christ displayed on the cross is the standard of love for one another. You want to know what love looks like? Look at the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross work of Christ is the standard for our love one another. Love is cruciform. It's cross-shaped. It's Christ-centered. It is defined by the sacrificial death on the cross for sinners, for an unlovely and unlovable lot like you and me. Now, Jesus does not mean here that we must literally be crucified to love one another. In the early church, many disciples thought that martyrdom, was the ultimate expression of discipleship. And certainly those who have died for their faith have witnessed to their commitment to Christ. But that is not what Jesus here is commanding. He is not commanding that we literally be crucified to love each other. No, what this means is that we must consider the interest of our brothers and sisters in Christ above our own. It's giving a definition of love that is sacrificial in nature. You see, the world defines love in terms of self-fulfillment, self-gratification, and self-absorption. I defined what love is. The individual defines what love is. So I need to be placated. I need to be accommodated. I need to be cared for in love. But Christ turns that on its head, doesn't it? For Christ, love is not self-gratification. Love is self-sacrifice. For Christ, the cross is the standard of love. As Ian Murray, the great Scottish writer, theologian states... The cross is the pulpit of God's love. The cross announces the love of God in Christ for an unlovely world. Calvin actually says that the cross is a theater that displays the magnificent love of God for the world. 
You see, in many ways, we recognize the church is not lovely, <laughs> right? We're fi- the church is filled with sinners, with selfish people, <laughs> with hypocrites, right? That should not be a surprise to anyone. But what unites us as the people of God are not our hobbies, are not our politics, are not our self-interests, it's not our socioeconomic status, is not our race, is not our education. What unites us as the people of God is that Christ has sacrificially given Himself for us as sinners. And He then is the model of our love. It's what unites us. It's why we're here today. There's no reason for us to gather together if not for the love of God that has gripped us and shapes us and informs the way we live our lives. It's a sacrificial love of Christ that defines us. And so then this leads us to the fourth and final point the apologetic of love, the apologetic of love. Look at verse 35. Jesus says, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this all people, all people, all kinds of people young and old, Christian and non-Christian, black and white, American and European, Eastern and Western, all people, all types, every tongue, every tribe, every nation will know, will know that you are my disciples. How? By how well you know your systematic theology? by how well you can regurgitate dates from church history, by how tightly argued your apologetics is. Is that what he says? Those things are important. They're essential for the Christian life. We're to hold fast to doctrine. And yet Jesus says, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if... You have love for one another. Dear friends, to the extent that Christ-centered love defines us, the watching world will measure the credibility of our witness. Did you hear that? To the extent that Christ-centered love defines us, defines our churches, the watching world will measure the credibility of our witness. Not only that, if you think that's pretty high, Jesus actually raises the bar even higher. In John 17, Jesus also states that the world will judge the truthfulness of the gospel based on our love for one another. See, Jesus says two things. If you put John 13 and John 17 together, Jesus says two things. In John 13, He says, the world will know that you are My disciples if you love one another. But in John 17, He says, the world will know that the Father has sent the Son if you love one another. So in John 13, Love is tangible evidence that you are a follower of Christ, that you're a disciple. And in John 17, love for your brothers and sisters is tangible evidence of the truthfulness of the gospel. And so as the world looks at the church, our relationships with one another either commend the gospel or show that the gospel is erroneous. Staggering, isn't it? The credibility of our witness depends in large measure 
not on how well we articulate our theology, as important as that is, the credibility of our witness depends in large measure on how well we live out our convictions with one another. Staggering. And so Jesus here is anchoring the task of apologetics in our capacity to love one another with the love that He has shown us. But dear friends, if that is true on the positive side, it's also true on the negative side. If Jesus' command is our marching order, we have to understand when we fail to observe this marching order, it diminishes our public witness. So the world will not know that we are Christ's disciples, and the world will not know that the Father has sent the Son if we do not love one another. How many people in your own life have you heard say, I tried Christianity out, but when I came to church, all I saw was fighting and backbiting, and so I left. Now, you understand the truthfulness of Christianity does not depend on you and me. The truthfulness of Christianity is objective. It is fixed. It's eternal. It's unchanging, regardless of whether anyone believes it or regardless of how well we manifest love. That's not what I'm saying here. But what I'm saying is the credibility of our witness, the integrity of our witness is compromised with a lack of love. Our lives commend the gospel or undo the gospel. Our lives should be characterized by winsome love for one another. Our failure to love, dear friends, will have a direct impact on our lives and, our, and, our, and on our churches. If we do not show each other the love of Christ, the world will not know that we are His disciples, and more soberly, the world will not know the love of God in Christ. You see, like tarnished bronze or silver, the luster of God's glory fades with the lack of love in God's people. You see, like unity is imperative for soldiers to commit to finish a task, we might say love is imperative for disciples to fulfill the Great Commission. We're called to cultivate love for one another. And dear friends, it's hard. When you look down the pew on Sunday and sometimes you see someone who has hurt you, when you look down the pew and you see somebody who has maligned you, and you realize it is hard to love the people of God. It is difficult to love the saints. And then all of a sudden you realize that the cross levels the playing field. You realize you too have offended the Lord God Almighty. You realize your sin likewise deserves death and punishment. And yet in God's kindness, He has not treated you as your sins deserve, but in God's loving kindness, He has redeemed you and called you out of darkness and misery and given you eternal life, and He has forgiven your sins. And now you look down at the pew and you see your brother or sister who has offended you, and suddenly it changes the way you look at them. As Paul will say in Ephesians 4, as God has forgiven you, so you forgive one another. As I have loved you, so you love one another. And in doing so, you commend the gospel. You commend the gospel to the watching world because it's inexplicable. There's no reason why we should love one another. And so when we do, what's the reason? It's the supernatural love of God that has gripped us and redeemed us and shaped us. It's the love of God. You see, we not only dishonor God when we squabble amongst ourselves, but we diminish our public witness. Many years ago in 1970, the great 20th century apologist Francis Schaeffer wrote a little book called The Mark of a Christian. 
I read it when I was about 18, 19 years old, about your age. If you've not read it, I commend it to you. Many people may know Francis Schaeffer for his philosophical books, but this is probably one of his uh, least known but important books. It's called The Mark of a Christian. And in this little book, Francis Schaeffer observes that Christ-like love is the final apologetic. You're going to learn about arguments for the existence of God. You're going to learn about arguments regarding the reliability of the Gospels. You're going to hear arguments about how science and faith harmonize. All of those things are important. But the culminating argument, the final apologetic, is our love for one another. Dear friends, if we speak in the tongues of men and apologists, but have not love, our churches will sound like noisy gongs and clanging cymbals. Why will the people want to hear what we have to say if we do not love? Without the love of Christ, why should the world listen to our witness? Love is the great mark of the church. It is the final apologetic. Our love for one another demonstrates that we are Christ's disciples, and, it, and even more, it displays the love of God for a fallen world. And so while the Christian faith is objectively true, regardless of how well we follow Christ's command, we should also remember that the world often measures the truth claims of Christianity against the lives of professing Christians. We are judged by our love by the watching world. And so when we fail to love, and we will, dear friends, you will fail to love, you need to remember the gospel says to you today, you are not loved by God on the basis of your love for one another. You are loved by God on the basis of His love for you in Christ. The gospel is free to all and to any, but only those who come to Christ through faith and repentance, they are saved. The love of God is for you in faith and repentance. The love of God says to the world, even though we were still sinners, even though we do not ultimately love one another as we ought, the gospel says while we were still sinners, God displays His love in this way. Christ died for us. It is the single message we have as the people of God. And so our love commends the gospel to others. It demonstrates that we're disciples, and it displays to the watching world the love that God has for us in Christ. And so if that is true, dear friends, and it is, perhaps a better question for us is not how shall we live in a post-Christian world, but how shall we love? Let's pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank You for Your love that You have shown for us in Christ Jesus. Forgive us when we have not loved one another. And Lord, we pray that today You would enable us by faith and repentance to trust in Christ and Christ alone, that we might know the love that He has for us and show that love to one another. We pray this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Thank you very much.